This is World to Win, bringing you the latest news and analysis from a socialist perspective. Welcome back to World to Win, everyone. My name's Toya. Unfortunately, Yara couldn't join me here today, but it's fine. You all will see her next week, and we, of course, will miss her. But we have two exciting guests here today to talk about something that we have talked about before and we're gonna continue to talk about until we do something about it, and that is the climate. So we have two members of the International Socialist Alternative here with us today, one in England, Wales, and Scotland, the other in Ireland, and both are organizing for um, uh, the COP26, which is something that we're gonna get into later. If you've heard about it before, um, make sure you're tuned in because we're gonna have ways that you yourself can get involved no matter where you are in the world. So let's get started here today. I wanna to say hello to my guests. So I'm gonna start with Haritha, who is in Ireland. It's good to see you again, Haritha. What have you been up to? Hi, Antoya, hope you're well. It's been great to, uh, to be back on the show. Um, recently in Ireland, over the summer, we've been doing a lot of work um, talking to loads of young people um, who have been extremely radicalized with how oppression has increased and become so much dark over the pandemic and speaking about how can we fight against racism, how can we fight against sexism, all in the context of the burning climate crisis right now. Thanks so much. I'm so glad that you were able to make it back on with us today. And Connor, it's great to have you back. Um, what have you been up to? Yeah, it's great to be back. Uh, the main thing that we've been doing over here is getting ready for freshers where the universities are starting uh, to open again, where we're going to be all over the country going onto campus, doing activity, uh, building for COP26 actually, um, and it's been very exciting so far. Well, this is the perfect episode to prepare for the beginning of school, um, so we're excited to talk to you both here today. So Connor, every so often we have this report coming out by the IPCC and, you know, regardless of all the science that's involved every single time, it's just telling us how much more dire and dire and crazy the situation is. Um, you know, even if you're not a scientist, it's very easy to see the differences, um, you know, over the years, how uh, uh, the climate is just getting worse and worse. Um, and the report itself is linking global warming to activities of humanity, which we have you know, known for a while and we've talked about often, even though there are people who still deny um, that this is the case, especially here in the US. Um, but you know, us as, as socialists, we not only talk about how it's human activity, we talk about how specifically our economic system um, is to blame for this climate crisis. Can you expand on this a little bit? Yeah, I absolutely can. I think of all of the problems that we talk about as socialists with this capitalist system, the climate crisis might actually be the clearest one as well. Um, as you say, human activity is, in a sense, a driver of climate change or the driver of climate change. This is certainly not a natural process that we're going through right now. But just to describe it as a human problem in general really kind of masks the fact the, the vast majority of us have no real hand in this crisis. In fact, for the most part, we're the victims of it. But capitalism, this system that we have, uh, it, the main driving force of it is this search for more and more profit. And I think the last few years especially show that in practice that is really incompatible with a sustainable existence on this planet. We know, for instance, that the vast majority of greenhouse gas emissions come from only a small number of companies with about 100 corporations since uh, uh, between the space of 1988 and 2015, producing 71 percent of CO2 emissions. Um, and that's fundamentally because their biggest concerns with producing ever greater profits rather than whatever effects that might happen on the planet as a result of that. Um, that you know, these are kind of seen as an externality, something else for some other people to deal with. Uh, and that includes, you know, the CO2 emissions that we talked about, but it also leads to other things. There's this enormous in inefficiency that we see with this system as well. Um, Capitalism generates problems like planned obsolescence, where products are produced with the intention of just breaking in a few years, getting thrown away, getting replaced, rather than being built to last. Uh, but of course, companies wouldn't make as much profit if they only had to sell you something once. Um, food as well, it's massively overproduced. Uh, a about a third of the food that we produce goes to waste. You see uh, 
you know, loads of footage of, of food that's left to rot so that the cost of food stays high, even while hundreds of millions of people go hungry every year and even more so during the pandemic. Um, and even that which is sold, you know, it's produced in a totally unsustainable way. The food that we get to our plates is often travelled across several continents before it's reached us. Um, and, and the underlying for all of the, uh, the underlying reason for all of these things is profit. It's about what's the cheapest way for these people to produce things. Where can they pay workers less? How can the capitalists make the most money? So yeah, I mean, climate change is a, a human problem in the sense that it's human beings making those decisions, but it's a very tiny number of humans, really. Um, and, and those decisions are made because of the system that we live in, because of this pursuit of profit. And um, there's no kind of choice that the vast majority of us could make as consumers that would change any of that. In some cases, there's not even any choice. Like, you know, with electricity, I would happily choose to uh, have all my electricity come from uh, green sources rather than fossil fuel companies, but that's the electric company's choice, not mine. Um, in fact, you know, given the choice as well, I think you'd, you'd be hard pressed to find anyone who would rather buy a phone that only lasted them a couple of years before it broke or a pair of shoes that falls apart after a couple of months. But as long as production's based on competition in the market, that's the way that these companies will produce things. So, you know, I, I think that's a big hole actually in the IPCC report. It does a really important job of highlighting some important facts that we're still heading for a climate disaster, one that's actually beginning to unfold already. Um, and also that since the previous report, very little has been done to actually change things. But it does stop short of pointing to why that is and who the ones responsible are. Connor, I really like what you said in that, you know, this a uh, report is extremely important because it shows us how bad the situation is, but it doesn't point towards a solution. Um, you know, and we're constantly, you know, besides the, the crises that you've mentioned, you know, energy, um, food production, we're also seeing devastating, um, you know, living conditions around the world. Right now in the United States, um, in the state of Louisiana, uh, we're seeing massive flooding. This is where the infamous Hurricane Katrina was in New Orleans. So these people are experiencing the same conditions over and over. And, you know, uh, in a previous episode, we talked about the situation in Afghanistan, and there's major drought going on right there. All things that are affected by the, the climate crisis. So Haritha, I want to go to you. If the situation is so bad and, you know, these reports that are coming out are not pointing in a direction of how we can solve the crisis, what's the point? Is there anything that we can even do? Toya, I honestly would be surprised if many people listening here today weren't in any way shocked or overwhelmed by the summer of complete environmental destruction that we've like witnessed. Like, as you said, seeing the refugee crisis worsen in some of the poorest parts of the world that are the most affected by the climate crisis, as well as seeing like the stark temperature jumps across the west coast of North America that literally caused sudden, dozens of sudden deaths um, especially for those who didn't have the access uh, to the luxury of air conditioning in their homes or in their hospitals. Um, it's clear that the system that we live under isn't abstracted, uh, abstractly destroying the future of the planet, um, but rather the planet will like probably survive any pretty pretty much any environmental destruction um, you know we inflict upon it, right? But hum humans cannot, and let's be honest, but like billionaires, <laughs> we've seen that they can shoot themselves uh, into space, but that's not a, a choice um, that working class people um, can afford. And I think the events of the summer as well have not just exposed the brutal reality of the climate crisis, but also made the fact that it is working class and poor people who are consistently the ones losing their lives and health to all of the crises of capitalism. Um, that we're the ones with the least responsibility for the emissions or for environmental destruction, right? As Connor outlined himself. Um, because capitalism is just characterized by its ruthless pursuit of profit, which means using the dirtiest resources, the dirtiest labor, and uh, in other words, that's just massive exploitation, right? So even though billionaire owners of oil and gas companies have known about the climate crisis for decades, they and their best friends in um, the governments, in the world governments, um, have little interest in really making any changes to actually protect us in our environment, because that would mean challenging the very exploitative nature of the system that they benefit from and uphold um, as the capitalist 
this class and its establishment, right? So when we know this, we can either look at this from an extremely negative and pessimistic perspective, think that, th that there's no change, uh, that there's no potential for change and that it's game over because someone like Joe Biden will only make the smallest changes um, to save face. Um, but of course, like again and again, whilst the capitalist state have exposed their lack of care um, for human suffering and death, um, for example, I know in the recent um, flooding in the uh, in the region of Zhengzhou in China that was devastated by flooding. I know one very horrific example would be um, 12 people literally dying in subway carriages as they filled with muddy water. They were literally clinging to ceilings, texting their loved ones goodbye. Um, but not only were their deaths entirely preventable um, if you know pollution had been properly addressed in the past few years and decades, but also 18 hours beforehand, a red weather warning had been issued in the area. So why were public transport services still running? If it were actually uh, workers and young people in the area who had a control and say over how the public transport system would run, would they have put the economy first or would they have actually called people to stay, stay safe um, and uh, in, in the safest place as possible and build the necessary infrastructure um, rather than you know, putting profit first. And I think even just to flesh out this example, um, whilst the billionaire and capitalist class have a vested interest in exploitation, workers absolutely do not, right? So in all towns and cities around the world, we should have free, high quality and frequent uh, green public transport. But will the private companies willingly organize this? Of course they will not. An immediate demand that we must put forward should be that public transport should be nationalized and not run for profit. But of course, we can't trust um, the governments uh, to provide the high quality connections that we need. So actually, it should be transport workers who democratically control how that runs, um, because they're the ones who have no vested interest in upholding um, the capitalist the climate crisis that capitalism um, has uh, been created. I think if we imagine this mirrored in all other socially ne uh, necessary sectors in society, um, I think we can really challenge any nihilism that exists because if we're able to plan society in such a way where overproduction is no longer an issue, where things are produced in a sustainable way, um, it is we, we can very um, it is much easier for us to make the necessary steps to, to really bring the climate crisis under our control. If you read the IPCC report, you will also see that if we are able to um, make uh, the, the most sustainable switches um, uh, possible, it is actually even even if we exceed 1.5 degrees um, of warming above uh, pre-industrial levels, um, in the next uh, decade or two, we can actually bring that back to 1.4 um, degrees. Um, so I think it's, it's really a question of who has the power in society and um, demanding that the power be put back into the hands of workers and young people. We've talked about how, you know, capitalism is uh, what is causing the, the climate crisis. But when we talk about that with people on the street, with young people, with workers, sometimes it can seem a little daunting, you know, like how what are we supposed to do about it then? If if our economic system, if the way that we live our lives is what is causing the problem, then what can working people do about it? Haritha, what would you say to people like that? Exactly. Struggle has been the driver for all social change throughout history um, and for all of the liberties and the quote unquote luxuries that many of us can enjoy today, like whether it be from the like the right to have a weekend um, or a union uh, to autonomy over our bodies, right? Struggle is what can challenge the very veins um, of capitalism. So because of that, it is also what the system fears the absolute most, right? And the system goes to great lengths to protect itself. And in terms of the climate crisis, this can be so audacious as to firstly denying the climate crisis as they have for decades you know, prior until this is too difficult for them to do because um, consciousness on the issue is moving forward and that, that is no longer possible for them to do. Um, so once that so once that becomes too difficult, they will either ignore it or they will even go to the lengths of blaming working class people for the climate crisis, right? Um, telling us just to turn off the lights after we leave a room, or um, even to try sell us a capitalist solution to a problem that um, the system uh, created by buying some marked up and greenwashed um, plant based food for our meatless Monday or something, right? And I'm sure like many listeners even here have like at some point felt guilty for the climate crisis as if we're not doing enough. And I think this is why the climate strikes were so monumental because it represented a mass understanding that the climate crisis is not an individual problem, but it's one that is completely rooted in the system, um, which has made it much more difficult for capitalists to constantly point away from the root of the, root of the problem, right? Um, 
But even like in 2019, you would have seen many world leaders uh, tweet support for um, the young protesters, maybe even like go down and like uh, snap a photo. I know that was um, the case of many establishment politicians um, in Ireland, snap a photo with some of the activists. But still, they take so many actions to prevent the climate strikes from being as powerful as they possibly can be. For example, anti-worker legislation around the world prevents workers, even in some of the most affected industries, um, from joining the climate strikes, as it often isn't um, an issue that's directly related to their paying conditions. Um, but it is actually these workers' participation in the climate strikes that could paralyze the economy and shut down capitalist pro 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 profits and actually force our demands much louder um, uh, our demands for system change, which is like exactly what they fear, right? And I think particularly COVID has over the past while and will continue to be used by the establishment to shut down safe and socially distanced um, protests. Even during the pandemic, members of the International Socialist Alternative from Russia to here in Ireland have faced fines and arrests for organizing protests on issues directly impacting our safety, such as gender violence, for example, and that's only worsened during the pandemic. And although we haven't seen mass strikes being organized on the issue of climate um, over the past while, as they as they do reemerge, we have to make sure um, that we are able to be as organized as possible because it is clear that the capitalist class are organized against us. Um, but this isn't a call for us to sit back and accept defeat, but recognize that no matter how th how how threatened they are um, by us, we as workers and young people outnumber the big business emitters exponentially, and we can quickly overpower them. Right? Uh, I think on this point we have very little choice because, as the ab abolitionist Frederick Douglass um, remarked, without struggle we have no uh, there is no progress. So one of our previous episodes, we went into Karl Marx and we talked about um, his work, you know, his most famous work, the Communist Manifesto, and, um, you know, made the case for the fact that even though Karl Marx was um, writing and theorizing, if that's a word, um, you know, 150 or more than that years ago, um, what he said um, and the work that he put in is still relevant today. But there are many people um, in the climate movement who disagree with that, who say that Marx didn't write about the climate. And because Marx didn't write about the climate, Marxism itself um, doesn't apply to the climate catastrophe. Um, Connor, what would you say as a Marxist um, to this statement? Yeah, well, I mean, obviously, climate science has come a long way in even the last 50, 60 years. I think it would be asking a little bit much to expect Karl Marx to have already come up with an analysis of the climate as it is now in the mid 1800s. But that doesn't mean uh, that he failed to take the environment into account. And actually, already, even in his time, the uh, kind of destruction caused by capitalism on the planet was becoming very clear. And uh, Karl Marx himself famously made the point that capitalist production simultaneously undermines uh, the, the, the two main sources of all wealth, uh, the earth and the worker. And he understood this idea that we touched on uh, just earlier of capitalism seeing these effects that it has on the environment as, um, as an externality. So he talked about what he called a metabolic rift between capitalism and the environment. So he made the point that humanity relies on the environment, that we're a part of it, but that the, the, the methods of capitalist production mean that it tries to draw basically a line between these two things. Instead of seeing the environment as something that we rely on, um, seeing it just as a resource to exploit. And 150 years later, I think that's actually even more true than it was in his own time. Um, and actually, it's, you know, it's by looking at the world as Marxists, by understanding how capitalism works, that even today we can understand the motor forces behind the current climate crisis. But also, um, as uh, we've started to talk about already, what kind of forces can change it as well? Um, and so for those reasons, Marxism is still incredibly relevant, I think, uh, when we're talking about the climate crisis. Uh, crisis. And actually, Karl Marx uh, had to argue against a lot of ideas that you even see in the movement now, ideas like overpopulation, uh, which many people kind of pin the climate crisis on these days, are actually not as kind of new ideas as I think some people might think. Um, you know, even in the 1800s, people like Thomas Malthus um, 
put forward these kinds of ideas. Um, they were described as Malthusian after Malthus, uh, the idea that basically the Earth can't sustain this growing population that it's got. Um, for Malthus, it was looking at things like the existing food supplies and jobs and, um, you know, using that to explain why there's all this poverty. Um, and he said, basically, there's just simply too many people, not enough stuff to go around. But Marxists have always pointed out that, um, that uh, it's production. It's, it's, it's the way that we're producing things that's the problem. And, um, I mean, you, you know, you look at the food waste that we were talking about earlier again. And I think that that's clearly true. It's not that there's not enough food, even with a way higher population than in Malthus's time. Um, we can clearly produce enough, but it's the way that we produce it, the really unsustainable way that we produce it that's the problem. And again, that's, that's the problem when we're talking about the climate as well. Um, it's that this stuff being produced in an unsustainable way, not that uh, there's too many people, not enough kind of uh, within the planet to to cope with the amount of people that we've got. We c we could feasibly actually uh, deal with many more people that we've got, and um, uh, you know you can you can look at the the data as well, like low income countries, which in 2014 were 52% uh, of population growth were in these low income countries. Uh, but they only saw a 13% increase in CO2, whereas uh, in high-income countries where population growth is is much smaller, more like 7%, uh, there's way bigger uh, CO2 um, uh, increases, so uh, about 29%, in fact. Um, it, it's about the way that things are produced rather than just, just the pure numbers of it, basically. Well, Connor, you, you, you know, sparked something in my head where you mentioned um, the fact that, uh, you know, underdeveloped countries are actually, even though their uh, population is growing, they're not um, producing the same amount of CO2 emissions as developed countries whose populations aren't growing at the same rate. You know, when we launched World to Win at the, at the beginning of the pandemic, and one of the themes that we talked about a lot was these inequalities um, uh, that were exacerbated during the pandemic between developed countries and underdeveloped countries. So you gave us a little taste, but can you go into a little more detail about that in regards to the climate crisis, you know, the differences between developed countries and underdeveloped countries? Yeah, I think this is another of these things that's becoming even more clear over the last year as well. Um, the fact that it is, it's, it's both uh, ordinary people in even kind of richer countries um, but, but especially in poorer parts of the world who bear the worst effects of this crisis. Um, and I mean, uh, you know, even, even within richer countries, you know, you can see, I think the example of the, the power outages in, in Texas, um, illustrates it very, very clearly, uh, where it was, you know, it was people of, of color, people in poorer areas who were hit by the, the first and the, the worst of these power outages because they were the ones that had uh, the worst kind of infrastructure uh, in their neighbourhoods, and Haritha even mentioned the the heat wave in Canada, where the people that were suffering the most from being hospitalised or even uh, dying as a result of the temperatures were those without the access to the kind of air conditioned homes that the rich were able to get by in. Um, and even then, like if people have access to the air conditioning, or e in the opposite case, like Texas, the access to heating, uh, just having the access um, isn't enough if you can't pay the bills either. But I mean, it's it's so much uh, clearer even then when you look at things internationally and with an international crisis like this, we do have to look at things internationally. And I mean, these issues of infrastructure, if that was bad in Texas, they're going to be even more the case in countries uh, outside of a country as rich as the United States, for instance, but especially uh, for people in countries uh, where, where uh, you know, uh, people are more reliant on agriculture for survival. Uh, they're already feeling the worst effects of changing weather patterns where both floods and also droughts have, uh, have both wrecked people's livelihoods. Um, and in fact, you know, uh, to, to kind of show that the way that this, this gap, uh, is the gap between the rich and the poor internationally is being 
in, in fact, kind of accelerated this growth between the two is being accelerated by the climate crisis. Uh, a study a couple of years ago from Stanford University in the US um, indicated that uh, the gap between rich and poor countries is actually 25% bigger uh, than it than it would have been since 1960 uh, without climate change. So climate change is actually driving these things itself. Um, and I think, you know, we'll see this continuing to happen. We'll see that gap continuing to increase. We'll see uh, uh, poorer people, poorer countries continuing to uh, suffer the most disproportionate effects of this crisis, um, losing their lives as a result of natural disasters and this sort of thing. Whereas, um, you know, those uh, in, in kind of the, 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 the the rich parts of the world, but especially uh, kind of the richest people in those parts of the world will be able to cope much more with many of the effects um, uh, of, of this kind of crisis. Connor, you mentioning the heat wave in North America really struck a chord with me. Yara and I joke on this show that we're always talking about the weather, but because this summer has been crazy with the heat wave, you know, and uh, whether you have access to air condition or not, um, it's becoming more and more um, uh, known that even the way that we're building our homes just isn't um, uh, sustainable in regards to uh, weather changing from cold to hot, cold to hot. But again, as we've mentioned throughout this show, um, it's capitalism that's the reason for this. You know, they want to build houses and structures in the cheapest way possible and the quickest way possible. And so capitalism itself um, doesn't allow for innovative thinking in regards to um, heating and cooling our homes, for example. Um, and we can find a million examples of this. But there are people who, um, you know, have the ability or the funds to take um, individual actions to be able to um, do their part, if you will, in regards to um, environmental destruction. Whether that be they carry around metal straws or they install solar panels on their homes, um, people can take these small steps. But then also we see, especially young people, um, taking more um, organized actions, um, whether, you know, school walkouts, etc. The, the famous um, Greta, who's, you know, traveled the world talking about the need for... Um, the need for us to address climate change. But Haritha, I know you've been very involved with organizing, um, especially among your classmates um, against environmental destruction. Um, but before we get into, you know, uh, specifically how people can get involved in this organizing, um, I want to talk a little bit about what sort of program is needed, right? Because we don't want this sort of hodgepodge, everybody's just doing what they think is going to, you know, we want an organized program in order to fight. So can you talk a little bit about what that program should be? Certainly, Toya. You mentioned a bunch of like individual, you know, eco-friendly switches that people, that have kind of been popularized over the recent period. And I think, it's so crucial that we don't understate the severity of the crisis that we're facing. Um, like literally we're in a situation now where many of the world's best climate scientists agree that we've left, you know, the 11,700 years of period of relative ecological stability that like all of class society has existed in basically the Holocene. Um, so the climate crisis is just so brutally unfolding before our, before our very eyes and it's only going to worsen and become more dire until necessary action is taken, right? And I'm not saying this to just state the obvious or to make anyone um, feel overwhelmed, but actually to show that in the face of a crisis this stark, is it actually in any way meaningful enough for us to put our focus on shaming working class people for not making eco-friendly switches in their lives? Like, unfortunately, um, we all know things like um, plastic straws, are less than a drop in the ocean in terms of the mass of pollution that exists, right? And although, of course, we support anyone trying to change their own lifestyle, um, but we need to recognize that is it enough to make, is it enough uh, for a small amount of individuals who can afford these changes um, to make this change on a personal level? Um, or is it even enough to call um, for uh, demands such as, even, even a demand such as a 50% decrease in carbon emissions by the end of the century. And no, none of these demands are enough. We have to recognize that our power in society does not lie as consumers. It, it, um, we don't produce value as consumers. 
um, we produce value in society as those who actually produce everything in society, who allow the world to run, right? So we need immediate and radical change. That means not being afraid to point to the very core of capitalism, exploitation, and to actually snatch the power away from big business and place it in the hands of the working class majority. Um, this, of course, means um, demanding massive uh, cuts uh, and uh, move away from fossil fuels and switches to renewables um, at a state level, but also recognizing that for us to best challenge the exploitation of the planet, we actually need to challenge every other form of exploitation. Um, so this actually means putting forward demands such as the mass building of eco-friendly, long-lasting and sustainable homes which are connected to renewables and are made work affordable to workers and families and are built on public land, not controlled by um, you know, vulture funds or uh, like um, really rich landlords. Um, it also means investing um, to create programs for green jobs such as in construction and uh, also investing in independent green research with good paying conditions, right? These are all things that benefit working class people. And also challenging agribusiness plays a crucial role and protecting our, our, our human lives and safety, right? Even if we consider the fact that the pandemic that we are living through right now and the five epidemics that preceded it since 2000 are all tied to the spread of viruses from animals to humans, right? Um, also, uh, another crucial demand um, would be, you know, uh, land back um, for indigenous peoples who should have control over how their land is used, right? Um, it is clear that there is no capitalist solution to the climate crisis and this is a crisis that will only continue to spiral in a world plagued with exploitation. So that means in the short term, um, we demand for uh, we demand that workers um, in in uh, that, that workers um, in all of the socially necessary industries are the one who actually have are the ones who have um, the democratically elected control over how their industries um, run, even in the short term under capitalism. But we also understand that unless we are able to plan society on, on the basis of our needs and interests in a world free from exploitation, we cannot um, see an end to the climate crisis. So actually our program, um, whilst making the immediate demands for change today, also needs to call um, for a socialist alternative um, to this system that we're living under. Haritha, I'm glad you mentioned, um, you know, uh, indigenous people and giving their land back. Our members in um, the International Socialist Alternative in Brazil are actively organizing around this right now. So um, check out our, our website if you want to read a little bit more about that. Um, but, you know, you, you laid out what we need for a program, and I, I think that that's super helpful. So... Uh, with this upcoming school year and, you know, all the kids are, 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 are headed back to in-person learning, um, can we, you know, rely on them to organize their school strikes to get us to where we need to be? Definitely, yeah. I think especially as restrictions are easing in many places, lockdowns are easing, more and more people are getting vaccinated. We're seeing a revitalization in um, the global climate movement, especially in the lead up to the next um, global climate strike on the 24th, which in many countries in the world will be the first return to in-person strikes um, since the pandemic. Um, we are also seeing the potential for mass protests at COP26, um, the UN summit, uh, where um, establishment politicians will meet and pat themselves on the back for um, agreeing to make the minimal changes that they probably won't even carry through, right? So um, we need to build for protests on, the, on uh, September 24th, but also this November um, for COP26, whether you can come to Glasgow yourself and join international socialist alternative activists or, um, you know, get involved with protests uh, locally wherever you live. I think we need to learn from the vibrancy, though, of the protests in 2019, but also, learn, of course, learn the lessons um, from them as well. Um, because if we couldn't trust the capitalist class then, uh, in 2019, um, after the period of increased devastation we've seen, increased suffering we've seen during the pandemic, as well as seeing movements such as the global feminist wave and Black Lives Matter um, expose the um, oppression that's endemic to the system since 2019, we should have absolutely no trust in the capitalist class to make the necessary changes. So. Um, and all young people who are in schools and colleges right now have a brilliant role to play, a really important role to play uh, in terms of organizing in your own school, spreading the word about um, the climate strike um, and protests. Um, 
whether you can set up a strike committee in your school, uh, even if that means uh, going behind the backs of school authorities. I know in 2019, I would be seen sticking flyers in the protests of school bathrooms um, uh, and like in, in people's lockers and stuff. Um, if, if that's what you need to do to get the word out there, feel free to um, use your TikTok, use your all your social media accounts, um, get, get in, reach out to any organizations in your local community, your student union. But we also need to remember the roots of strike, strike action. I think this is something that if we saw in 2019 could have made the protest so much more powerful, right? Um, strike has the power to actually shut down the economy um, and show who really has the power, who really produces the value, who really allows the system to run. So even if, you're, even if your school management um, aren't totally supportive of the climate strike, talk to your teachers, talk to the local teachers unions, bring um, the staff along with you, but also, now is the time to force trade unions um, into actions on the issue of um, the climate, um, because there is nothing. There, there would be nothing more powerful uh, to to force our demands louder um, uh, than actually a general strike of workers in all industries um, on uh, the climate issue. Um, I think it, it can sound. Uh, it, it can sound. Um, this can sound like uh, such a. Um, such a, such a massive task, um, but as the climate crisis is only worsening and we're seeing increased anger and outrage as it's becoming more and more real to our everyday lives, um, we are gonna see increased potential for struggle to emerge as well, right? Um, and as Lennon pointed out, there will be no final crisis of capitalism unless it is given a death blow by the working class. It will continue to make billions of people suffer, further decimate the environment and cause new wars. So we need to recognize um, that in, in the crisis that we are facing right now, um, we are really at a crossroads, sorry to be quoting Lenin and then quoting uh, Luxembourg, um, between uh, socialism or barbarism. Um, so even if there aren't uh, going to be mass protests on the climate issue um, by the end of 2021, wherever you're living, you listening to this podcast right now shows um, that it is necessary as we're seeing um, strikes and protests, you know, um, open up again on so many different issues of oppression and exploitation that we are able to have the force necessary um, to take these strikes, take these protests um, and, uh, and um, bring them into revolutionary moments that can actually have the power um, to overturn society. And that, um, that means getting involved with the International Socialist Alternative as we are, um, as we are mobilizing for the COP26 protests. I'm sure there will be a Google form somewhere uh, in the description or in the comments. Um, so definitely sign up. We can't wait to see you all there. Definitely, if you're able to go to Scotland, I believe uh, is the, the COP26, um, uh, make sure you sign up so you can come with us, uh, whether you live in Europe or not. Um, it's going to be an exciting and important um, uh, opportunity for us to put forward this program that Haritha um, laid out for us. But it's not just the responsibility of the young people and the students, although um, they are the ones that are really pushing, they're the ones that have the energy, they're the ones that invest are invested um, in their future to, to, to save the planet and, and save humanity. Um, we also need to, and Haritha mentioned this, we need to look towards the labor movement. And I'm glad you mentioned this idea of students talking with their teachers and the teachers unions. You know, teachers, um, some of them are, are young too, and some of them aren't, but um, they have a vested interest and are passionate about the climate as well. And so we do need to unite these struggles of, of um, students and teachers. But Connor, I want to talk a little bit more about other um, aspects of the labor movement because, you know, the ruling class loves, 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 loves to pit workers against environmental activists as if they're two opposite ends of the spectrum um, and this whole idea that we can't save the environment because of jobs. You know, and it's just absolutely ridiculous. Um, and, you know, myself, I'm an electrician. And so um, I love the idea of a Green New Deal because that would mean employment for me for a very long time. But I think one of the problems is, is that people can't conceptualize this. People don't understand uh, what, uh, you know, some sort of green jobs program would actually mean. All they know are the dirty energy jobs. And so therefore they say we have to protect those jobs. So Connor, what would you say to these workers, um, you know, if 
in order to convince them that we do need to move in the direction, regardless of what the capitalists say, um, move into the direction of uh, green jobs as opposed to dirty jobs. Yeah, I think this is an important question. It's something that's so crucial for us in the climate movement to to try and overcome. Because if we're trying to build a mass movement uh, with with you know uh, workers strikes playing a key role, like Haritha was saying earlier, we do need to fight that narrative that there's some kind of choice between, on the one hand, maintaining jobs for workers, and on the other hand, saving the climate. Um, and I mean, yeah, you've, you've kind of made the point that uh, some union leaders even as well as just capitalists have um, have kind of tried to pose it like this. Um, and that's unfortunate um, because uh, really, yeah, it's, it's a totally kind of uh, pro-capitalist argument. Um, and, uh, you know, there's been certain examples that we've seen over the last few years of, uh, for instance, uh, some union leaders trying to organise against attempts to move away from coal mining in some countries like Germany or Poland. Um, of course, for the bosses of those mines, any attempt to limit the amount of coal that they can produce means that they're going to look to cut jobs because they want to maintain their profits. Um, but for us and for the workers' movement, that shouldn't be just a reason to say, oh, well, keep the mines open and carry on destroying the planet or whatever. Instead, uh, I, I mean, firstly, it's a reason to protect jobs. And, and that's exactly the role a trade union ironically can and should be able to play in a struggle like that, not just arguing for, uh, for, for, uh, for uh, you know, for preventing climate change, but also um, for defending these jobs um, and, and, and creating new ones as well, like you were saying. But that ultimately means raising these other questions that we're talking about. It means uh, taking these corporations out of private hands uh, and bringing them into democratic control and management uh, by workers and by society as a whole, so that we can plan a real just transition where uh, where workers can guarantee uh, a, a transition to uh, whether you know whether that's jobs in green energy or other socially useful kind of projects or retraining if they need it, all on decent terms and conditions as well. Um, but I, I think that this idea of like a mass green jobs program is is absolutely necessary if we're if we're talking about approaching our teachers or any other workers um, uh, putting forward the points that you know we we, we need uh, public transport systems uh, we need a mass program of of retrofitting or building new environmentally sustainable housing. And that all takes jobs. Uh, that all, you know, that 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 all requires people to be able to do these things. Uh, so far from actually uh, uh, cutting jobs, uh, any kind of green transition that's that's uh, really kind of <laughs> worth its salt is going to provide um, uh, millions of jobs in reality. Um, and actually, it's not the case that workers are opposed to doing something about climate change. Um, in fact, uh, they're increasingly supportive of it. Um, of course, at the same time, they, they you know, they, they want to be able to, um, to, to kind of say confidently that they can feed their families and this kind of thing. Um, so, uh, I, th I think, uh, building these links between the workers' movement and the climate movement has to uh, bring these kinds of questions into it. And, and and I think we can look towards even recent campaigns from workers uh, for inspiration on this. For instance, to, to go back to Germany, um, there, there was a campaign um, in 2019, um, and I don't speak German, so I'm sorry about my pronunciation here, but Fair Vandal, uh, Fair Change, um, where tens of thousands of metal workers in Germany demonstrate for green jobs by investing in power grids, investing in local public transport, exactly these kinds of programs that would provide the jobs that they need. Um, as well as that, um, a study of North Sea oil workers, for instance, found that if they were guaranteed, uh, or, or, you know, workers said that if, if they had a guarantee of secure employment in a green field like uh, renewables or offshore wind farms, 80% of those that were surveyed said that they would consider actually changing jobs. Uh, although only 9% have actually heard of this idea of a just transition before. And that's something that I think that uh, obviously, we can we can push and 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 really raise the idea of uh, because it can potentially find a lot of support. I think that both of those examples show that. 
Um, but we have to also stress the point that a transition like that isn't going to be done if we leave it in the hands of uh, the capitalists, um, because any transition that they handle, even even if we can pressure them to do it, is going to be done as, as far as they can uh, get away with in their interests um, as much as possible. That means doing it over the bones of the working class. Um, and so we need to organise and fight to uh, to, to uh, make that transition on the basis of, of of workers having control over this sort of thing um, uh, as part of a wider change of this system. So, Connor, I have one last question for you. Um, you know, we, we've talked about today how capitalism is the pro problem. Haritha laid out um, a great program for us and what we need um, in order to start to address climate change. And, you know, what we call for is a socialist transformation of society. What, you know, all it means is we want to take out the profit model. You know, we want to um, produce and create um, and innovate for human and planet need as opposed to um, making a few people rich. So, you know, if we were to have this socialist transformation of society, um, what would be some, you know, uh, in the immediate, uh, you know, terms, what would be some changes um, that would be made in order for us to actually address um, climate catastrophe? Yeah, I think there's a number of things that we could immediately do um, if, if we had a, a socialist alternative to this current system. Uh, we could immediately begin by uh, taking the wealth off of the super rich, uh, taxing um, big business, closing down the tax havens and using that enormous wealth that's actually there in society, but is currently being hoarded or wasted on vanity projects, trips to space. For the billionaire class and this sort of thing that 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 huge wealth could be used for such uh, more more useful things it could be uh, put towards funding mass investment in green energy uh funding this free high quality public transport that we were just talking about um uh funding the construction of affordable energy efficient homes and, and, and creating the jobs in the process um, that would provide big benefits to ordinary people um, on top of, you know, I, I think public transport, decent housing, these are things that beyond just fighting climate change would all benefit the vast majority of people. Um, but, but these kinds of projects would also need us to, uh, to take these big polluters, take the other key sectors of the economy into public ownership. Uh, you know, currently, and this is this is one of the big contrasts to how uh, a, you know a, a socialist kind of solution to this would look like. Even if a capitalist government wanted to undertake these kinds of big infrastructure or climate projects, they they don't have the means to. Uh, the main levers of the economy are still in private hands at the moment, and and will only be used for those projects that those private interests see as profitable. Um, but, but under public ownership with democratic control and management, um, with society controlled by the vast majority of people, including, as we were saying, like indigenous people around the world, we can immediately do things like halt deforestation projects as well and actually even fund reforestation projects to reverse some of the damage that's been done. We could uh, build defences and restore funding to emergency services to deal with the immediate effects of natural disasters. And that's something that, you know, requires a kind of foresight, uh, thinking about what we actually need and will need. And that's that's something that when you're chasing after immediate profits like this current system does, is uh, almost impossible to do. Um, but I think one of the other crucial things that 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 we would immediately be looking to uh, see, you know, from from kind of socialist uh, governments on this kind of question is action on an international level, um, which, again, this this current system has just completely failed and shown itself to be incapable of doing. Um, we've talked about the, the COP26 conference that's coming up later this year, the 26th such conference where, where capitalist powers have totally failed to uh, meaningfully act on this crisis, so instead kind of, you know, uh, being, being kind of um, held back and, 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 and put, put ahead of uh, this action. Uh, their own national competition. We've seen even over the last year things like this new Cold War uh, between the US and China, the rise of vaccine nationalism, totally defining um, really the last uh, the last year in terms of 
the world situation. Um, and they're all examples of the way that this national competition totally stands in the way of progress on international issues, international crises, and climate change is no exception to that. Um, and especially in a situation where clearly there's no national solution to this crisis, you know, changing even one country um, isn't enough, but um, uh, a socialist government could immediately break with the kinds of patents that capitalist companies use to block the sharing of crucial technology for green projects. Uh, we could immediately cancel foreign debts uh, from poorer countries and allow them to actually fund the projects that they need to deal with this crisis as well. Mm -hmm. And even an international group of of, uh, of, of socialist countries um, would, would stand in total contrast to the kind of competition rivalry, the unplanned nature of capitalism in the face of this crisis. And, and, and could point towards a solution on the basis of freely sharing this knowledge, the skills, the technology across borders on the basis of solidarity and our wider need to actually tackle this crisis rather than just thinking about profit. Um, I, I mean, there's so much more that you could say, but I think that as like a, as initial steps that we could take, those are some of them. Um, but that's why we need to build an international movement against this crisis as well. And of course, in ISA, in International Socialist Alternative, we organize internationally because we do want to fight um, for socialist change on an international scale, which is something that's even more necessary when we're dealing with something like climate change. Connor, I totally agree. And if you're watching or listening to this today um, and you want to get involved, um, you know, in fighting for a socialist transformation of society, please check out the International Socialist Alternative. Um, but if you, you know, aren't quite there yet and uh, want to still fight uh climate catastrophe, please join us at the COP26 convention. Um, and you can find in the link description how you can get involved. I want to thank Connor and Haritha both for um, coming back. And I hope to see you guys again real soon. Thanks so much, Shoya. It's been a pleasure. Hope to see uh, some of you there in Glasgow as well. This was such a great episode, and now we're going to go to the shout out of the week. Unfortunately, the shout out of the week is not something exciting. Um, the shout out of the week this week, we wanted to dedicate to um, a member of the International Socialist Alternative in the US who recently has passed away. Um, it's extremely devastating. Uh, his name was Jeremy Prickett. Um, and many of you who are watching or listening may have known him because he uh, was a part of the socialist movement since the 90s. Um, he was a union member. Uh, he organized tenants, um, just an all around amazing person. And so, you know, if you, uh, if you knew Jeremy Prickett, uh, if you organized with him, please, uh, you know, mention in the comments, um, one of your fondest memories that you have, um, with him. He was a good friend of mine and I, I will miss him. Um, and his family has asked instead of flowers being sent to them, um, if you want to, uh, contribute uh, to the memory of Jeremy to make a donation to Socialist Alternative. Um, and you can find a link below um, to make that donation. Uh, these actually were uh, Jeremy's, Jeremy's wishes. Um, and so, yep, we wanted to just dedicate this episode um, entirely to, to Jeremy and his memory. Um, we're all going to miss you. So, I want to thank everyone for watching and listening, um, and we will see you next week. This is World to Win. Every Sunday, we broadcast with speakers from across the globe, bringing you the latest news and analysis on the fast-moving global events from a socialist perspective. Subscribe to the International Socialist Alternatives YouTube page and click the bell to get notified when we go live for a new episode. Like us on Facebook and follow us on Instagram because there's a lot to do and we have a world to win. When they fight! When they fight! When they fight! Solidarity!